want a war, you're gonna get one. Now get the gun if the trust to my generation I'll take the fall, the saints And the cross of nations Head into six The heart of freaks The fraud The messing with me Go, go, go Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome to the 31st of March 1997. We're six days away from WCW Spring Stampede. Nitro is live tonight from Roanoke, Virginia, while the WWF show a taped episode of Raw this week from Peoria, Illinois. The Spring Stampede review will be available later this week, as usual. If you want to see it a little early along with the next episode of Reliving the War, that's all available on Patreon. But if you're happy to wait it out, make sure you subscribe so you get notified when the Spring Stampede video goes live. We have a ton to get through this week. Raw kicks off with the Owen Hart vs British Bulldog European title rematch, while WCW give us a Lex Luger and Giant vs Roadblock and Ric Fuller match, and a Harlem Heat promo. Let's take a look at the Raw match first of all. This is the Bulldogs' first European title defence since winning the championship in Berlin. The underlying problems between Owen and Davey reached a boiling point last week, and it looks like the tag champions are never going to recover once this match is in the books. Owen attacks Bulldog during the entrances. Davey gets thrown into the ring steps and he gets his back rammed into the ring post before the bell rings. After saying that Davey stole the European Championship, Owen throws his opponent into the ring and the match officially begins with Owen performing a top rope crossbody and Davey kicking out a two afterwards. Davey begins fighting back with right hands but Owen puts his brother-in-law down with a kick to the balls and the referee allows it. Davey's also got a busted nose and things aren't looking good right now for the European Champion. Owen lays in a few mounted punches before it's announced that the Legion of Doom will challenge Owen and Davey for the tag titles at In Your House. Owen then lands a clothesline and apologies for the rough quality here with the video and screen caps. This episode of Raw doesn't look so good. Owen then pulls off the ultimate dirty move, the most heelish thing you could possibly do to the British Bulldog. Owen applies a Davy Boy Smith chin lock on Davy Boy Smith. Davy Boy Smith takes his own chin lock. Fucking hell. This is worse than Shawn Michaels putting a sharpshooter on Bret Hart. Even Owen looks at the camera as if to say, I can't believe I'm actually doing this. Bulldog gets pissed off at the audacity of his brother-in-law but Owen puts Davy back down with a knee to the midsection, or a kitchen sink as it used to be called. Does anyone still call this move a kitchen sink by the way? Owen continues his attack as Vince runs down tonight's card. The Undertaker is in the building for Raw, we have another Goldust vs Triple H match, although Marlena and China are barred from ringside. And Bret Hart has a match against some job dude later who should be thankful he gets to share the ring with his excellency. Owen goes for another knee but Davey counters it with a pin attempt, only scoring a two. And Davey's momentum is stopped right away with a kick to the face from the corner. Owen has completely dominated this match so far. Davey takes a drop kick, a pile driver, a suplex and another chin lock but he refuses to give up. After performing a jumping back elbow, Owen goes to the top rope for a drop kick but Davey counters with a sharpshooter. The king of hearts should have kept those chin locks to a minimum. Owen quickly gets out and he hits an enziguri. He sets Davey up for a superplex and he manages to land on his feet when Bulldog fights back, resulting in Owen knocking Bulldog out of the ring. A plancha gets countered and Davey drops his tag team partner across the guardrail. And now it's finally time for Davey to take control. Owen takes two clotheslines before getting slingshotted into the top turnbuckle. He then gets lifted high in the air and dropped on the mat before taking a back body drop. And the match goes to the rampway where Bulldog hits Owen with a suplex. Davey keeps his momentum with a press slam back in the ring but a referee bump ensures Owen won't get pinned anytime soon. The King of Hearts takes advantage with a spinning wheel kick. Owen then goes to the outside and he grabs a chair. He tries to hit his brother-in-law but Davey kicks Owen. Owen falls on the chair after taking a clothesline. And just as Davey was about to finish Owen off with a chair shot, Bret Hart hits the ring and he stops the Bulldog from attacking. We'll come back to this in a moment. 
Members of the NWO are seen arriving at the building, but it isn't the whole squad. Luger and the Giant vs Roadblock and Ric Fuller are going to start us off. This one does sound quite predictable, doesn't it? Giant Package make their way down to the ring to take on Ric Fuller and Roadblock. Let's call this team the Full Cock Block. Like last week, the audience at Nitro were much louder than the crowd at Raw and it does add to the excitement. The Giant makes quick work of Ric Fuller with a few corner strikes followed by a running clothesline. The total package gets tagged in and Fuller gets a brief moment to show what he can do but it isn't much. Fuller gets floored with another clothesline. A rake in the eyes allows Fuller to tag in Roadblock. The big man pulls off a stinger splash before nailing Luger with an elbow drop. Luger fires back with a running forearm. Eventually the giant comes in and he takes out both Fuller and Roadblock with a double clothesline. The crowd gets all fired up when the giant signals for the choke slam. The giant hits Roadblock with his finisher and whoa 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 uh, there you go Luger racks Fuller to end the match. Harlem Heat then hit the ring and a fight breaks out, remember there's a four corner match between these guys at Spring Stampede. What's interesting here though is Tony Schiavone announcing that this right here is the Spring Stampede main event just before we go to commercial break, but if we learned anything in last week's episode, it's to not trust the word that comes out of Tony's mouth. When we come back from break, Mean Gene gets a word with Harlem Heat and Booker T says this is all about Harlem Heat finally getting some respect in WCW after being with the company for so many years. Stevie Ray says it's the same guys week after week in the ring and getting promo time and this is disrespectful to Harlem Heat. Gene asks about Stevie and Booker potentially fighting each other in the Four Corners match but this was totally ignored. Sherry says that Harlem Heat will divide and conquer this week on pay per view. Bret Hart has a few things he wants to say on Raw while Miko Satomura takes on Toshi Uematsu on Nitro. So this Nitro women's match with two wrestlers who no one in the building even knows is a tournament match for the newly created women's cruiserweight title. I know what you're thinking too, I'm thinking the same thing. WCW have done next to nothing with their women's championship so why on earth would they create a cruiserweight championship too? I wish I knew, I could dig into it and probably come up with some explanation about WCW wanting the belt to get defended in other promotions, seeing as these ladies here are from the Gaia organization in Japan, but I really don't care enough about it and I'm sure you don't either. WCW certainly didn't care about it because a grand total of 7 title matches took place during the belt's 5 months of activity and that includes the tournament final, a final that takes place on WCW main event. Look at these faces in the crowd, these guys know this is some grade A bullshit right here. Miko Satomura looks absolutely delighted while kicking the shit out of her opponent but it's Uematsu who gets the win with an admittedly awesome looking splash from the top rope. You can now totally forget about the WCW women's cruiserweight title because you'll never see it again. Waste of time. Bret Hart stops Owen and Davey from killing each other and after resisting for a few moments, the tag champions decide to hear Bret out. The hitman says Owen and Davey are fighting because that's what the American fans want. The fans don't have any family values and they're happy to see this family get torn apart. Bret says the USA have based their history on brother versus brother. They have talk shows where the families tear each other apart because they hate each other and this is what the fans have done to the hearts. They turn the Hart family into a quote bunch of haters. Brett reminds Davy about SummerSlam 1992. Davy and Brett fought like men, Brett hugged Davy afterwards, but as soon as they came back to the United States, they were at each other's throats again. As for Owen, the hitman says it was he who got Owen a job in the WWF, and in return, the fans pushed and pushed the brothers against each other. And look at Owen's reactions during this promo, he was absolutely brilliant. I can't remember where I heard it, it was maybe in Brett's book or in an interview somewhere, but I recall hearing that Owen was trying to make Brett laugh during this very serious promo and I've no idea how Brett didn't lose it. Brett says he used to dress Owen as a kid, he would back Owen up when the youngest heart went through some hardships at school and nobody was there more for Owen than Brett Hart. The WWF and the American fans turn Brett and Owen against each other, they even turn Brett against sister Diana Hart 
And it's all because Americans don't understand family values. Brett says he needs Owen and the Bulldog, and when Brett tells his little brother that he loves him, Owen breaks and the tears begin to flow. Brett hugs Owen, Davey shows he too is gonna stand by Brett, and then we get this little moment here that I thought was great. Brett gives the crowd a real shitty look as he hugs Owen and Davey boy. The Hart family is back together, the new version of the Hart Foundation is now here on Monday nights, and we'd see a few more members get added in the coming weeks. Even Jerry Lawler shed a tear at the Hart family reunion. Psychosis vs Viano 4 on Nitro, El Mosco vs Supernova on Raw. Psychosis won his match with his guillotine leg drop, while El Mosco beat Supernova with an Arabian press moonsault. During the WCW match, Kevin Nash, Six, Wall Street and Big Scott Norton were having a conversation backstage, and it was clear that the NWO were having some problems. The guys didn't say exactly what the problem was, but it was something about someone needing to take charge tonight, and Kevin Nash saying that you're either with us or you're with them. Hogan is nowhere to be seen, Bischoff is nowhere to be seen, Scott Hall has been missing since last week, there's something going on with the New World Order and the commentary team says they'll stick with this story as Nitro progresses. Next we had promos on both shows, LOD over on Raw and Ric Flair on Nitro. The LOD promo was pretty straightforward. Jim Ross tells Hawk and Animal that their chances of winning the titles looked a lot better before the Hart Foundation became united as one earlier on, and Animal tells Bret Hart, Owen Hart and Davey Boy Smith not to talk badly of the American people or the World Wrestling Federation. Animal then talks about teams working together in every sport in order to be the best, and in the WWF the team that works the best will rise up to become the tag team champions. The Legion of Doom plan on showing that they're the best when they take the belts away from Owen and Davey at In Your House in a few weeks time. Hawk talks about kicking the doggy dumplings out of the bulldog and doing some other unspeakable things to Owen Hart. He didn't make a whole lot of sense here and even Vince McMahon said that Hawk must have been gargling razor blades before his promo. Standard Legion of Doom stuff here, if you like LOD you'll probably like this short promo. Ric Flair gets the Nitro crowd hyped up but he's interrupted by Roddy Piper. And take a look at these guys bopping to Piper's entrance music. Oh, 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 listen to that. <laughs> well done lads. Piper comes out to confront Flair, remember Rick has been talking a lot of trash about Piper ever since Uncensored, and Piper starts the promo off by squashing a rumour, a rumour that Ric Flair's girlfriends call his waterbed the Dead Sea. Flair replies by saying he's glad Piper had the time to bring his Hollywood ass to the arena tonight to join everyone for Nitro. Flair says he's been telling everyone that Piper's the man but it's been difficult recently since Roddy began going to bed early at the hotels and he isn't at the bars anymore. But from what I gather from the general incoherency of Flair's promo, Rick wants to let bygones be bygones and bring the old hot rod back by hitting the bars tonight. Flair says he doesn't want any piece of the guy who put Hulk Hogan to sleep twice on pay per view. Piper says Flair is a 13 time champion, he'd rather stand at his side than fight him, and Rick then brings a random girl into the ring wearing a Roddy Piper shirt as a kind of gift to the hot rod. I'm so fucking confused here. Flair was talking all sorts of shit over the past two weeks about Roddy and not only that, the whole basis of the Super Brawl match was about how Piper was a strong family man. Now he's accepting random girls from the nature boy and he's hitting the town with Slick Rick. Well, Piper has the perfect excuse I guess, he just needs to go home, he sits the family down, and he tells everyone that he was just conducting horseman business. All will be forgiven afterwards guys, works every time. Still, it's a baffling promo that made no sense at all. Hopefully this goes somewhere but I wouldn't bet on it either. We've got the Parka vs Prince Ikea next on Monday Nitro while Jesse James goes to war with Jerry Fox, another Roy on Raw's war and not the last we're gonna see this week either. Some kid won a competition or something to be a guest manager tonight on Raw, and he's managing Jesse James tonight. Look at that face. 
clearly young Nathan here wanted to bring Steve Austin or The Undertaker to the ring tonight, and not this country singing mid Carter, but beggars can't be choosers. Double J tries to get Nathan to dance, and our guy here pretty much tells Double J to fuck off. The kid's disappointment just radiates through your TV screen. Speaking of disappointment, the honky tonk man is here, and he says his protege search is nearing its end. Thank God. He's got a few guys in mind and he's putting over Jesse James strong not only for his in-ring abilities, but also his singing abilities. Double J destroyed Fox here as expected and the honky tonk man revealed that James is on the top of his list for potential protégés. James wins the match with his pump handled slam and then honky tonk man gets in the ring to try and get Double J to become his new little project. Not only would Double J carry the honky tonk man's guitar, but Honky Tonk says he'd dye Double J's hair and help him grow some sick sideburns. How could you say no? To show he's all business, Honky Tonk Man wants to present Double J with a family heirloom. Yep, that's what he said, a heirloom. James is gonna get the Honky Tonk Man's guitar as a gift tonight. James says he's holding musical history, he's lost for words. He doesn't know what to say, so instead he breaks the guitar before leaving the ring. The no good and great son of a bitch. All Jesse had to do was say no. Prince Ikehead dodged a corner attack at the start of the TV title match and the Parker crashed into the turnbuckles. He quickly recovered afterwards though with a heel kick. A botched corner backflip follows and Ikea gets rocked here, but he's able to continue afterwards. I think this was Prince's fault for not getting in the corner in time, but you don't want to point fingers at these kind of things either. It sucked, but it could have been way worse. The Parker hits a power slam afterwards and he follows this up with a backsplash. A corner springboard moonsault from the Parker then hits its target, but a missed shoulder charge leads to the match going to the outside. Prince Ayaka performs a springboard twisting uh, karate chop, but the Parker turns it around by throwing his opponent into the guardrail before grabbing a chair. With Prince Ayaka sitting on the chair, the Parker performs a dive and the TV champ gets wiped out. Back in the ring, there's a clear communication problem when Le Parker stops in his tracks during an Irish whip attempt to kick the Prince. Le Parker runs again and Prince pulls off a sidekick, and the whole thing looks really awkward. Le Parker then sets up a chair to perform a baseball slide to the outside and the chair falls down. Prince holds it up and takes the bump afterwards. And for some reason, the bell rings, but the match isn't even over yet. What's that? The bell rings? This has been an absolute mess. The Parker uses the chair when performing a splash to the outside, a la Sabu, but it isn't enough to end the match. The Prince goes to the top rope, the Parker grabs the chair to protect himself from the aerial attack, but Prince ends up hitting it anyway, and Ikea wins. This match was bad. I know people love La Parker, and he's one of these guys we aren't supposed to say anything bad about, but this was just flat out shit. Too many things went wrong. Still, the use of the chair in this match helped establish La Parca as the chairman of WCW. Steve Regal vs Chris Jericho is up next while Savio and Crush do battle with Adam O'Brien and Rod Bell. More like Roy O'Brien and Roy Bell End. You know, I like the Nation of Domination faction and I like the idea behind the group, but I don't really care for Savio Vega or Crush while they were in the faction. Savio was a great and underappreciated wrestler and he did need a change of character before joining the Nation, but it's weird how he probably meant less on TV after joining a group that meant more than his singles run. Crush? I don't know, the best thing he done was get screwed over by two doinks. So Adam O'Brien, anyone know who this is? This is Adam Pearce, current on screen authority figure on WWE programming. As for Rodney Bell, guess what he does now? Absolutely nothing. Shawn Michaels phones in and he says his recovery time has been extended thanks to Bret Hart's attack last week. Shawn then says he wants to address Bret, but he won't do it over the phone, he'll do it next week on Raw's War. PG 13 kept Bell End on the outside and surprisingly, Adam O'Brien got in a few dropkicks that stunned Savio and Crush, but as expected, the Nation of Domination won the match. Savio held Adam so Crush could drop an elbow. One thing is for sure, the Nation of Domination needed Farouk. He was what made this all work, especially in the early days of the faction. 
Steve Regal cut a promo before his match with Chris Jericho where he said that now Eric Bischoff is suspended, he can once again go after the TV title. That makes no sense at all seeing as Bischoff was suspended last week yet Randy Savage got a shot at the title due to the NWO winning the uncensored match. And I'm just totally past all that uncensored nonsense at this point, let's just roll with it. I'm sure you've realised though that in terms of continuity, WCW has been a real mess since Starcade 96, whereas the WWF have done an excellent job in keeping storylines consistent week in and week out, the Bret Hart story being the prime example. Anyway, Steve Regal vs Prince Iakea takes place this week at Spring Stampede. The crowd chants USA at the Brit and the Canadian as our match gets underway, and Regal uses those tight mat based skills to bring Jericho down. Chris fires back with a super hard clothesline showing Regal that he doesn't mind getting a bit rough when he needs to. Chris performs his corner dropkick while Regal stood on the apron and Jericho brings Regal back in with a suplex, but the fans are totally distracted by something going on in the audience. Must have been a fight or someone getting turfed out. Chris performs the lion salt but he only gets a two count. He sets Regal on the top rope but his lordship pushes Jericho down before kicking Chris in the head. Regal then goes for a short arm clothesline but Chris counters with a super kick and a surprise pin leads to Chris winning the match. Regal attacks Chris after the bout infuriated that he was caught out once again on Nitro. Chris takes a fantastic looking underhook suplex from the top rope before getting hit with a pile driver and then Regal performs the Regal stretch. The renegade runs out but he doesn't help Chris, he backs off instead. Joe Gomez then hits the ring and he breaks the hold but he also takes a pile driver for his trouble. Billy Kidman and Lenny Lane also get taken out by Regal and the segment ends with Regal celebrating while laying in a few more kicks to Chris Jericho. The WCW commentary team talk about this perceived split in the new world order. Apparently Hogan Bischoff and a few others are attending a movie premiere with Dennis Rodman and that's why they aren't here. Kevin Nash is clearly annoyed about the whole thing. The Undertaker and Paul Bearer cut a promo on Raw, while WCW Women's Champion Akira Hakoto does battle with Debbie Combs on Nitro. Debbie Combs had worked for the WWF, the NWA and the AWA during the 80s and she also had a brief WWF return in 1994. It's very strange that she would show up here on Nitro but I guess either the company were trying to get more American women on their roster or someone was doing her a favour. In saying that she only wrestled this one match for WCW in 1997 and also, and I'm just being honest, she wasn't very good. I was about to say that the women's division in WCW was nothing more than an afterthought but hey at least they had a women's division. The WWF had no women's wrestling during this time period, they were still trying to find their women's belt. Before the women's match on Nitro, Mr Wall Street left the arena. Mike Tenay says that the NWO seemed to be breaking off into their own factions. That stuff was still over a year away with the NWO Wolfpack but still interesting to hear this take in 1997. Akira Hokoto won the women's match by performing a German suplex, the same move her spring stampede opponent Medusa used last week. Speaking of Medusa, she cut a promo after the match. She just got done getting a few cheap pops before Akira attacked her on the rampway. The two have a brawl where the Gaia women have to pull Akira away while Debbie tries to calm Medusa down. Sonny Ono ends up getting caught by Medusa but nothing really comes of it. Remember how Raw got cut off last week and we were left with a lot of questions? Well those questions get answered this week, kind of. We see clips from when Raw went off the air and Paul Bearer wanted to join The Undertaker once again while seemingly ditching mankind and, presumably, Vader too. This week Paul says everything he done, he done it for The Undertaker. Paul said he had to let The Undertaker stand on his own and it was this that led the phenom to the World Wrestling Federation Championship. Paul admits he held Taker back in recent years but he desperately wants to join forces with The Undertaker one more time. The Undertaker comes out and he locks the casket that sat outside the ring, not wanting any surprises and making sure he doesn't get double crossed by his old manager. The WWF Champion says he can't forget betrayal but he might be able to forgive it. The Undertaker admits that he owes Paul Bearer a lot. It looks like the dead man and his old manager are gonna reunite as The Undertaker presents Paul with the WWF Championship. 
But then Taker floors Paul with a big right hand and the crowd goes wild. The Undertaker then stalks Bearer around the ring, he picks up the urn sitting on top of the casket, but he doesn't notice Mankind under the ring. Foley throws a fucking Hadouken or a Yoga Fire right in Undertaker's face, Taker rolls on the floor in pain and Bearer hugs Mankind. It was all a big setup. Psycho Sid then shows up and he chases Mankind and Paul out of the arena. The Undertaker begins blindly flooring referees before also leaving through the crowd. Sid cuts a backstage promo afterwards where he says The Undertaker was the better man at WrestleMania 13, but The Undertaker will always be the better man where Mankind is involved, no matter what day of the week it is. If you play with fire, you're gonna get burned, and Sid says if you play with fire with The Undertaker, you're gonna burn in hell. Not sure if I like good guy Psycho Sid, he helped Shawn Michaels last week too instead of being the absolute unhinged lunatic that we all know and love. Triple H took on Goldust next while Mongo and Double J took on the Amazing French Canadians. No, not the Quebecers, the Amazing French Canadians. Honestly, I'm so done with the Goldust vs Helmsley rivalry at this point. I think Goldust was so watered down before turning heel that any impact he could have had as a babyface has been totally squandered. And while China adds an interesting layer to Helmsley's character, we already know she can destroy Marlena if she really wants to, so the feud is really going nowhere. The women were barred from ringside during this match, but that didn't stop China from showing up and making sure Goldust didn't win the match after performing the curtain call. There was way more heat after the final bell than before it. China pulled off a spinning back elbow, and I'm sorry, I thought this looked better than Chris Jericho's Judas effect. Goldust goes down, officials hit the ring to break up the fight, and Pat Patterson starts throwing punches at Triple H. This leads to China and Hunter taking out Patterson in the corner. Why Pat Patterson decided to fight this week, I don't know, but it was great. China squares off to Goldust before leaving the ring, and yeah, the match had nothing we hadn't seen before, but the post-match stuff was pretty good. On Nitro, Mongo and Double J lost to the French Canadians when Public Enemy showed up, Johnny Grunge took the magical briefcase away from Debra, Colonel Robert Parker then took the briefcase, and the briefcase finally went to Jacques Rougeau. Mongo gets clocked, he takes a very Mongo-esque bump, and the horsemen lose again on Monday Nitro. Another promo after the match, Debra again gets booed when she says Public Enemy caused her to break two nails last week. Mongo says he turned around and saw Double J with the briefcase so it had to be Jeff who attacked him. The fake Double J says he's tired of being tired of everyone accusing him of being responsible for the downfall of the four horsemen, and I don't think that's the problem Jeff. I think the problem is that this horseman storyline has went on way too long without any twists or any turns. It's the same stuff every week and it's boring as hell. Some say the Paul Roma days of the horsemen were the rock bottom days of the horsemen, but watching this back, I'm not so sure anymore. The horsemen were the premier heel group of WCW for a very long time, and because the NWO have taken that spot with great success in terms of viewership, it feels like WCW has no idea what to do with Ric Flair's faction. Steve Austin's back and he's gonna cut a promo on Raw while Chris Benoit goes to war with Hugh Morris. We get another Horseman promo afterwards. Steve Austin's promo is an important promo, it's his first word since the submission match, and Austin starts it off by saying he did not submit at WrestleMania. In regards to Brett saying he beat Austin to a bloody pulp, Stone Cold says he hit his head on the guardrail and that's what caused the bleeding, Brett didn't do a thing. Stone Cold reminds Brett that the hitman couldn't get the job done, he couldn't make Austin submit. The match stopped because Austin was losing more blood than what his heart could give. Steve then makes it crystal clear that his character isn't going to alter following WrestleMania. He says you can look at Stone Cold and you can think he's a class act or a jackass but it doesn't really matter. Stone Cold isn't changing for anybody. When the bell rings, no matter if he faces a good guy or a bad guy or whether the fans boo him or cheer him, Steve will still get the job done and that's all that matters. Steve reminds the fans that he's the 1996 king of the ring before challenging Brett to come down for a fight. 
Brad shows up on the Titan Tron and he says Austin knows Brad plain and simply kicked his ass at WrestleMania. Austin got busted open because it was Brad who threw him into the railing. If Hart and Austin were going to continue to fight, then Brad says he would just kick Austin's ass again and again and again. But Hart announces that he's actually through with Steve Austin. He's done. He has nothing to prove by fighting Stone Cold again. But Austin says this will never be over. The only way for Brett to end this feud would be to kill Stone Cold. And Austin says one day Brett's gravestone will read, Here lies Bret Hart, the biggest piece of crap who ever walked the face of the earth. And the reason he's laying here is because Steve Austin whipped his pink and black ass. Another fantastic promo from Austin. No one could deliver promos quite like Stone Cold in 1997. It took Chris Benoit all of about a minute and a half to beat Hugh Morris with a German suplex and then the inevitable Dungeon of Doom run in happened. Jackie got involved and she pulled off a top rope splash, but her second attempt was stopped by a woman. Oh, Kevin Sullivan denied that he attacked Arn Anderson two weeks ago at his hotel room by the way. I think Sullivan's going after Benoit because Chris blamed the former taskmaster of attacking Arn, but at this point, who knows. Ric Flair runs down for the save while Double A stands on the outside. Anderson lets Sullivan pass him on the way back up the ramp even though Sullivan just attacked a horseman. But this faction is far past fucked at this point and I don't think anyone could have cared less. There needs to be a kind of four horsemen reboot at this point with a brand new story, a new main enemy and possibly a reshuffling of members. Flair takes everyone out single handedly making both Chris Benoit and the Dungeon of Doom look like shit. Arn says he's hurting but he'll always watch the horseman's back and that's what he's doing tonight. So why did he let Kevin Sullivan walk past? I don't get it. Chris then sends a message to Sullivan saying that Kevin's career is coming to an end and Kevin is failing at making all the wrongs of his life into rights before hanging up his boots. Benoit faces Dean Malenko this week and Chris says he respects Dean just like Dean respects him. But at Spring Stampede, it's not about respect, it's about victory. And strangely, Chris says his victory this week won't be for the horseman, it'll be a victory just for him. Benoit then has a slightly awkward handshake with Arn Anderson and the interview ends. The final segments of the week then, Bret Hart vs Rocky Maivia on Raw and we have two WCW matches to end Nitro. DDP vs uh, Lance Ringo and High Voltage vs The Steiner Brothers. It's announced that In Your House Revenge of the Taker will feature another Psycho Sid vs Bret Hart match as the hitman makes his way down to the ring. We have a little fun at Rocky Maivia's expense here on Reliving the War but this is quite a noteworthy match, The Rock vs Bret Hart. The IC title is on the line here as Rocky brings Hart to the corner. Bret decides to slide out of the ring afterwards like the heel he is and take a moment to regroup as the crowd boos. Bret offers a handshake to Rocky afterwards but Maivia rejects it. Jerry Lawler has been pretending to get emotional all night after the Hart family reunion and he continues to wipe tears away when Rocky won't shake Bret's hand. It's ridiculous but very amusing too. Tony Atlas watches on from the audience as Bret brings Maivia to the mat with a waist lock takedown. Rock and Bret then trade wrist locks before Maivia comes at the hitman with a crossbody, but he only gets a two count. We see a side headlock from Bret, a hammer lock from Maivia, more wrist locks follow. Maivia gets the upper hand eventually, and when the two lock up again, Maivia gets whipped into the ropes and he takes a knee to the midsection, or that kitchen sink we were talking about earlier. Brett then runs Rocky's face against the top rope before kicking the future great one in the face and Brett makes it look very easy with an inverted atomic drop followed by a clothesline. Hart then brings Rocky to the corner where Maivia takes a few right hands and Brett chokes his opponent with his foot. The hitman then gloats afterwards and he gets a round of boos. Brett had a good deal of experience working heel so he had no problem getting the crowd fired up. We come back from a commercial break and Brett is still firmly in control. Maivia is no match for the hitman it seems. He does try to surprise Brett with an inside cradle but Brett kicks out and he makes Rocky pay afterwards with a backbreaker. The hitman then misses his second rope elbow drop which you don't see all that often and Rocky comes back with his punch combo that makes him dance like an absolute lunatic. Maivia then lands a fisherman suplex and a belly to belly suplex. 
but his float over DDT doesn't look that hot. The recovery though is absolutely fine. Rock then hits his top rope crossbody but Brett rolls through. Erd Hebner is very late in counting the pin and Brett argues with the referee afterwards. The match ends with Brett pulling Rocky's legs to the outside corner and we see the figure 4 around the ring post. Brett won't let go of the hold and so Hebner disqualifies the hitman and Rocky retains the IC title. Stone Cold Steve Austin runs down and he attacks Brett. This leads to Owen and Davey coming out to help out the hitman. The Road Warriors then manage to chase the Hart Foundation away and the heels escape through the audience. The show fades to black with Stone Cold staring at the hearts. Nitro's gonna have to do something special to win this week's episode of Reliving the War but if anyone can do it, it's Lance Ringo. Lance Arsehole is better known as Sick Boy, a member of Raven's Flock. An old Ringo star here still wrestles today. He comes out with that mucky magazine featuring Kimberly Page and I'm not so sure if that was a good idea. DDP smacks Ringo across the face before hitting a high angle inverted atomic drop. We see a back suplex from Dallas but Lance manages to pull off a springboard dropkick afterwards, pretty much the only thing he would do in this whole match. DDP boots Ringo in the midsection, he applies a wrist lock, Ringo goes up on DDP's shoulders and we see the diamond cutter. 1, 2, 3, Page wins on Nitro just before his big match against Randy Savage this week at Spring Stampede. After the match, DDP addresses the Kimberly photo shoot. He says both he and Kimberly are proud of the magazine appearance, so that's that. Dallas says he'll never forget what he and Elizabeth done to Kimberly at Uncensored, that was personal, and if Savage wants to enter DDP's world then Dallas will snap into the Macho Man's. Savage shows up in the audience along with Liz, the crowd chants Macho sucks, and Randy says Elizabeth smartened him up, he knows DDP stands for Diamond Dallas Page, he knows Kimberly is the Diamond Doll, and he knows the Diamond Cutter is a move that Page will never put on the Macho Man. Savage says he doesn't care if Kimberly shows up at the pay per view, everyone is gonna see if DDP has any family jewels at all. Savage believes Paige has none. DDP says that Kimberly will be at Spring Stampede, and if Paige is bringing the lady, then Savage might as well bring the Trump, Miss Elizabeth. A good promo here, and there's some good heat between these two. What's interesting though is that this will be the main event for Spring Stampede, and not the Four Corners match like fucking liar Tony Schiavone said. So there's a lot of pressure for Diamond Dallas Page this week in Tupelo, Mississippi. It looks like the Steiners didn't know they had Pyro this week, it kinda catches them off guard. High Voltage meanwhile don't even get entrances for their Nitro main event match. Scott and Chaos starts this one off and Scott tags out after nailing a pump handled slam. Rick comes in with a Steiner line and a released German suplex. Chaos rolls out of the ring and this gives Robbie Rage a chance to ram Rick's head into the ring post. Rick was suffering from a busted eardrum and Scott had to rush over to check on his brother. Chaos and Rage then pull off a drop toe hold and a vaulting leg drop combo. High Voltage then try to keep Rick away from his corner while targeting the head and ear. But Rick gets an opening when Rage misses a springboard somersault senton by a fucking mile. It still looked very impressive though and you gotta remember, these high voltage boys weren't small by any means. Scott comes in, he hits Chaos with an overhead belly to belly and Rage gets dropped with a gorilla press slam. Scott then picks up the win by performing the Steiner screwdriver. A fun match, definitely, but not what I'd call a main event match. Even the NWO couldn't be bothered running in. Speaking of the NWO, before Nitro goes off the air, Kevin Nash and Six take over the announce table and Bobby Heenan's escape plan doesn't work out too well. Big Sexy's pissed off during this promo. He says he has no idea what's going on with the New World Order. He's here, Six is here, and Scott Hall's dealing with stuff more important than professional wrestling so while he isn't on Nitro, he's still accounted for. Kevin says while Hogan, Bischoff, DiBiase, Vincent and others are hanging out with Dennis Rodman, Nash and Six are taking care of business. NWO business. Nash tells the NWO members who aren't at Nitro that they need to keep focus. Big Sexy's tired of other NWO members taking his time and Nash is a guy who can stand on his own and still make it in WCW. 
Six has problems with his headset and he has a mini match with it while complaining and Kevin rolls his eyes while blaming WCW. Kevin says he'll be at Spring Stampede and if he has to do it alone he'll still beat the Steiners. Six continues to get annoyed at his headset and the producers try to wrap up the show and this annoys Six and Nash. Kevin wraps it up by saying if he has to he won't just fight the Steiners by himself, he'll fight WCW by himself. This promo was excellent. Kevin Nash was annoyed that the NWO guys weren't at Nitro and he pretty much threatened to leave and fight WCW without any help. The NWO was supposed to be all about the takeover and Kevin reminded the NWO that the takeover should be the focus and not hanging out with celebrities and missing shows. This felt real and this is what WCW were good at doing if they also kept it relatively simple. Not that Taskmaster stuff about playing chess and being too legit to quit and whatever other nonsense Kevin Sullivan thought was cool at the time. A good end to Nitro but not enough to beat Raw's war. Raw wins reliving the war this week, it was another show heavily centred around Bret Hart but it was very entertaining, the main event was good too. Nitro was decent, not great but decent. I really like Nash's promo, 6 vs the headset was a good main event too, but Nitro's getting let down by the silly amount of horseman promos and matches that are nothing more than reruns. We have seen it all before and if this keeps up YouTube's gonna hit me for using reused content. And with this victory Raw now has 31 points, Nitro has 36 points and we've also had 10 ties on the board. Nitro won in the TV ratings with a 3.4, Raw managed a 2.7. Join me later in the week for the Spring Stampede review, that'll be live on Sunday but if you don't want to wait you can check it out now on Patreon along with the next episode of Reliving the War. Hope you like horseman promos because we've got a lot more of those next week on Nitro and on Raw we have a Steve Austin vs Mankind main event and we also have Shawn Michaels back for an in ring interview. I hope to see you this week and next Thursday, thank you so much for watching and take care.